task, and that is to secure the environment, secure the anonymous environment. So we'll secure anonymous account. And really, the only way to do so is, or two ways to do so, is to either set a password for anonymous, if you'd like anonymous access to remain, or delete the anonymous account altogether. We suggest you delete the anonymous accounts using delete from standard SQL statement, mysql.user. This is standard SQL statement to mean db.table name. We need a where clause to set our criteria, and the user is going to be equal to nothing. Again, let's just confirm why the user is equal to nothing. When we look at the shell, we see that there's a user nothing for the field followed by localhost. And there's also a user nothing followed by the fully qualified domain name. And then we've got two root users followed by the two versions of the host name. So that's why we delete where user equals blank, because there are two instances with the default installation of user equals blank. So this is to be deleted. And we will execute this command from the shell by pasting it in. And momentarily, the client returns the number of rows affected. Whenever you execute a query, whether it's a status-related query, such as show tables, show databases, show users, or a SQL query, a DDL query, such as a delete, update, etc., or a manipulation DML query, versus a DDL or any type of SQL query, MySQL, the client, returns the number of rows affected, and we indeed expected two rows to be affected as a result. To confirm that the rows have been deleted, let's select star from user once more, and we should only see instances for the root user to be able to connect from the local system as localhost or using its FQDN of Linux CBT serve for .lacbt internal. Now another thing you should do after you effect permissions or authentication changes is to flush the privileges. Flushing the privileges ensures that these permissions take effect immediately. Otherwise, the permissions that are in place will continue to persist for currently logged in sessions. So after you make permissions changes, flush the privileges to be sure that subsequent connections and existing connections can no longer proceed using the privileges that you've updated, whether it's removing anonymous, so on and so forth. Now again, we've mentioned that once within the terminal monitor window, you can execute certain commands to get information, such as show databases, which reveals the various databases, show engines, these are the types of database engines supported by this release of MySQL, with the default being indicated as MyISAM, which represents the table structure we see beneath varlib MySQL and the name of the table, such as MySQL. So this is the default storage engine, but MySQL supports many other types, including memory, which is like a tempfs. In other words, it stores the tables in memory, and this is great for running systems that need very fast or lightning fast performance of database information, but of course it, the information doesn't persist when the system loses, loses power or resets. Uh, there's InnoDB, BerkeleyDB, a black hole which is like dev null just for testing. Example, archive, CSV for those making use of comma separated values. CSV will produce comma separated values for you and other types of storage engines. So show engines returns that for you and you can also look at the current process list to see what's currently being processed or what sessions are active to determine if there are any runaway processes or too many connections to your server and so on. Now let's just briefly take a look at the shell. We did mention that there's a global configuration file in ATC. That's the my.cnf file. This file contains INI, Windows INI styled headers and sections. So in the case of MySQL D, the daemon reads the directives following this block or following the header MySQL D. It derives data directory, socket where to store its information, and whether or not old passwords are supported for compatibility with 3x clients. There's a MySQL.server section, which is also processed by the server. It is to run as MySQL, the user, and the base directory is varlib. 
and MySQLD safe, which derives where the log information and the PID file. So this file is read by default by the server. But I need to memorize this. If you execute MySQL or the name of the client help, you will see the, the section that's read by the client. If you scroll up far enough, it tells you the names of the section's process. The following groups, and they're called groups, are read. When you use the standard MySQL client, it will look for a group named MySQL as well as a group named client. So blocks that include these two names, and when it finds either or, it will process directives from it. And ditto for other programs, including the MySQL daemon itself. MySQL D, the safe option, help, and you will see in the dump what options it uses, and MySQL D has the same thing. So they tell you what options they read, and it says all other options are passed to the MySQL D program, so you'd have to actually run MySQL D to get a sense for the options that are supported, and of course it's not in our path because it's in user live exec, so that's user live exec, MySQL D, help to get a sense for the settings that are supported, and it tells you it supports many, many options, so we should use verbose help, and let's go ahead and indicate that, and you'll see momentarily, and there's so many options, including the default, but if you scroll up above the default section, you'll see the sections that are read by the daemon when it starts. Let's go up and try to find it in this dump, and the dump seems to be even overrunning our buffer, so it may not even fit within the window space. This should be sure. And the options, as it mentioned, are numerous, too numerous to dump, so we're unable to see it in this particular case. But again, the options that are supported by each and every daemon can be returned using man and the name of the daemon, or man and the client, so daemons and clients. And those are the options that you may enable or disable. And you can also set those options on a per user basis, which we'll show you momentarily. So let's create a fifth task, and that is to create a sample database. So create database address book. We always like to create a simple database to give a sense for how easy it is to use the SQL commands and get up and running. So we need some SQL commands. We first need to create the database. So let's go ahead and indicate that. And in fact, you can script or lay out all of this information in a script and have MySQL read it using standard in. So we will just insert all of the statements here and dump it to a separate file and then instruct MySQL, the client, to process that file. So the first step is to create database and we'll name it address book. That's the first command and perhaps we'll label address book with capital A and B to delineate between the two words. Then we'll create table contacts. In it we'll have a contacts table which will store certain fields which include using backticks or single quotes, first name, setting it to car 20, the data type supported by MySQL can be returned or researched using the documentation provided with MySQL. But many of the data types supported by standard SQL engines are supported by MySQL, so there really isn't much new here. So we'll set last name to car 20, and we'll keep on going. New line, business phone, car 20 as well. And again, you can be more precise in your setup. And you can also find many scripts online, the many MySQL scripts that you can make slight modifications to. And also learn from. So email is car 30, and we want to set a primary key on email. So primary key on the email column. This is an important column. We don't want duplicate information for this particular column. So with that said, this will create the database and create the table. We can do it manually from the MySQL terminal monitor. Let's find that instance. And we will also drop it and recreate it using a script or an input file. So there's the database. Now when we execute show databases, you'll see it. And by the way, MySQL, the client, the terminal monitor the client, maintains a command history like the bash shell. Just use the arrow key to go through that history to reference a recently executed command. So now we've got an address book 
database. But before we create the table contacts, we should use address book. You want to change the context to the appropriate database before creating tables. This applies across the board. So now we're in the context of the address book database. And if we show tables, zero rows will be returned. Now let's create the table contacts with our important fields and of course this can be all altered once it's up and running using the appropriate alter command and now we'll attempt to create a table and it tells us that there's an error in the input near the email field let's take a look to see what's wrong with our output chances are we're missing a comma to the to the denote the primary key and there it is so let's just include a comma in our output we didn't include one after the email field and now we actually have a table. So let's show tables, which should be in our history somewhere, and there's the table. You can describe the table using describe, which is another SQL command. So describe contacts, and there's a description of the contacts table, which includes the names of the fields and their field types, and whether or not nulls are permitted, primary key, which can be on more than one column, if there are any default values, and any extra information pertaining to those columns. But of course, if we select star from contacts, zero rows will be returned. There's no data in, or there are no data in the table. So at this stage, the next logical thing to do is to insert data. But we did want to show you how to affect all of these changes from a script. So what we'll do is create a new file. And since this is occurring on the remote system, we'll paste it into the shell. And in the home directory on the remote system, we'll nano, then paste, and then we'll save the changes. Let's make sure this is all on one line so we don't clobber anything. Save the changes. We'll write it as create address book db.mysql. So now we've got this file create address book db.mysql. The MySQL client, if you run it with help, will accept a file from the command line using standard input, which means we use the lesson symbol. So here we finally have an opportunity to use standard input redirection. MySQL, various options for authentication, the database.